every concept is in its strongest form. It is this rich tapestry. And that's what's so good about Dostoevsky. Welcome to the first episode of Better Red Than Dead. This week, we're going to be discussing Dostoevsky's Notes from Underground, actually one of the most popular books on our list, and I'm really excited to have the guests here today to discuss it. This book is arguably one of the first existential novels, um, and it is broken into two parts and follows a narrator. But to dive into this very complex but revealing and fascinating novel. I am very, very pleased to be joined by Senator Amanda Stoker from sunny Queensland. Thank you so much for being with us. Hello. Thank you for having me. And also in studio with us, I have from the Generation Liberty team, Theodora Pantelich, who is a massive Dostoevsky fan, and I know you are very excited for today's episode. I sure am, Renee. It's great to be here talking about probably the best writer of all time, as you will shortly see. <laughs> well, it's good to start on that 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 big note. So um, as you are such a fan, Theodora, I thought maybe we would start with you telling us a little bit about Dostoevsky himself. Yeah, of course. So uh, Fyodor Dostoevsky, he was born in Russia, in Moscow in 1821, into quite a wealthy family, a noble family. Um, he worked as an engineer for a while before he branched out into writing um, with Poor Folk, which was his first novel, which opened the door for his literary journey. But um, he did have quite a few hardships in his life, which really come through in his novels later on. So for example, he was arrested for being part of like a socialist reading circle in his youth, in his twenties, I think, um, which was reading banned books. He was sent to, uh, after enduring a mock ex execution, he was sent to a Siberian prison camp for four years before serving six years in the military in exile. Um, he also had, um, a problem with ep epilepsy, a lot of health problems. Uh, he had a gambling addiction later in his life. Um, but, and, and he sort of ran the gambit from absolute poverty to literary rock star in Russia. So, but yeah, he was hugely influential. He influenced a lot of later writers like Solzhenitsyn, Chekhov, um, even the works of Nietzsche and Jean Paul Sartre. Um, and I think his books have been translated into something like 170 languages, which I think is pretty cool. So he's definitely a very, very influential figure in world literature. Yeah, thank you for that. It gives us uh, an idea of the kind of breadth of his life and how much that he managed to experience and achieve. Um, Amanda, when I contacted you to come onto this show, you chose this book pretty immediately. So I'd like to know why you chose this out of the, the 12 books on the list and also why you think it's um, important for young people to read Dostoevsky. I chose this book because I had read and loved and was an enormous fan of Crime and Punishment. And I thought that given how significant I had thought that book was, um, this one would be a really interesting journey and an opportunity to sort of understand more of the ideas that he flagged in that book. So, um, I mean, it's probably worth briefly mentioning some of the ideas from that book that sort of, um, piqued the interest in this one. But um, for anyone who hasn't read Crime and Punishment, um, it's got this fellow in it who um, has come to the view that there is no God and that um, the idea of morality is cowardice. It's um, in a way just people are only moral in their behaviour because they're too weak to rise above the norms and, and defy by by doing more or different um, behaviours, even if those would be ones that we regard as immoral. Um, and when he lives out this theory, he finds that it transforms him into a completely different person in a way that throws his world into chaos. And so I found it a really interesting story about the way that um, morality matters and the way that um, our actions matter. There, there isn't a nihilist sort of truth. And so having found that fascinating, I really wanted to read this one. To take the second part of your question, though, why do we have to read? Um, 
there's there's a really good phrase um, that I think I picked up from a discussion between um, two brilliant blokes, uh, the late Roger Scruton and um, Jordan Peterson in a discussion they had a couple of years ago. And in it they said that literature can in many ways teach us so much more than what we might be able to get from textbooks or history because in many ways the personalities in it are kind of meta-true. Um, they, they take to, together in one place all of the lessons from many lives um, and share them all in a single journey rather than having to take the lives of five or ten or fifty people and understand them inside out in order to glean the wisdom from their experience. And um, so I think when we engage with literature, we can much more effectively walk in the shoes of people really different to us in a way that helps us understand them socially and politically, psychologically. And when we do that, we have a better human experience, I think, a better ability to understand and tolerate the differences in each other and a better ability to serve and assist others. And uh, really that's, that's the exciting stuff that life's all about. Yeah, I've listened to the same uh, discussion and I think within that discussion, um, Jordan Peterson also has a wonderful description for that books, um, especially great books like this one is, uh, they're not just books, they're kind of portals um, that transport us into uh, understanding different times but also uh, realising that there's such a connection um, between the people to, that lived in the past even to uh, to us now. Um, but going back to the book, this book itself, um, this book is split into two main segments. Um, so, Amanda, I thought you maybe could tell us a little bit about those, those two parts, but also I would be interested um, in your thoughts on a uh, continual um, phrase that he returns to, which is living underground or um, under the floorboards, depending on the translation. It's the more accurate translation, right? Yes, <laughs> depending on the translation <laughs> you're reading. I'll defer to Theodora on that as our, um, as our Russian speaker, but... Um, yeah, my understanding is that the the better translation um, of the Russian to English isn't um, notes from the underground, um, but rather notes from sort of under the floorboards, and that I think gives it a really different character. It's it's not about some sort of um, subversive movement as we might think about sort of the underground now, um, but rather a, a way of living that is detached from the way that everybody else lives, and a decision that this bloke has made that um, he chooses not to engage effectively with, with the people um, in the society around him. Um, and so that's that's a sense in which um, the title is to be understood. But the book's in two parts. Um, the first part is this long, almost um, confession. It's a sort of philosophical ramble in which this bloke um who's a civil servant and he's bitter and twisted. He's not a nice guy. He knows he's not a nice guy. And he just he spews it all out. He confesses a lot. And you can't help but think that he's sort of saying that if I confess it all honestly and I repent for all of my many, many flaws, then I'll be a better person. Um but he never takes, I guess, the next step that comes in redemption, and that is to change. Um, you know, if you're a person who uh, believes in God and has a faith, the process of confession has to be matched by the attempt to change your behaviour. Um, this guy doesn't do that. And instead he kind of just goes, well, I've confessed it and that's proof to me that rationality and morality, um, they fail us in, in the complexity of the world around me. And so, you know, I am just this bad guy. And so that's, that's sort of the first half. And in the second half there's more of a, a narrative going on um, in which I think we get a better understanding of the implications of the way he sees the world in practice. And uh, I guess the, the most important 
narrative part of that is that there is a, um, a prostitute by the name of Liza and he, you know, being a very intellectual man, um, gives her this, this grand speech about how she needs to transform her life and do better and how he will help her do that and he, make, he makes a lot of sort of big promises about the ways he wants to rescue this woman um, and then when she comes back to claim that rescue, to ask for that help, he pretty much abandons her. And the, and the book, um, you know, I guess spoiler alert, the, the book doesn't even really conclude properly. Um, he doesn't even kind of make the courageous decision to come to an end, to stop writing. It just sort of ends. And so what we're working with is not really a great narrative. We're dealing with instead a really deep dive into the psychology of this bloke and the ways that um, his ideologies and his psychology um play out to help us understand, I think rather importantly, the world at the time, or particularly Russia at the time, of 40 years before the Russian Revolution. Um, and when we put it in that context, it's a really interesting snapshot into the thinking and the ideologies and the mindset that drove people into that extraordinary moment in, in history. Um, so... It needs to be understood in context, I think, for you to get its full benefit. If you just read it on its own, um, it can at times seem a bit rambling, but when you layer upon it um, its historical context, um, the ideologies that come through and some of the psychological concepts that come through, it is this rich tapestry of all of the thinking movements that were really big in that place and at that time. And for that reason, it's a pretty special book. Yeah, I think that's really true about how you kind of have to see it within a bigger picture and within the context of the time. And also kind of looking at the way it's written, I was struck by when I was reading it, how different and transgressive it must have appeared at the time. This must have been so um, revolutionary or um, even odd to some people first reading this at first. Um, but Theodora, what are your thoughts on the kind of two parts? And also maybe you could explain to us the, um, the translation, what's, what's the most accurate um, for uh, underground or under the floorboards? Yeah, well, so as Amanda said, the correct translation would be notes from under the floorboards. There was a, an English translator, I think, in 1918 uh, who – chose to call the book Notes from Underground and that became the recognisable title and it's stuck with every tra English translation of the book we've had ever since. Um, and you could say that that's, you know, it, it's just an insignificant translational preference, but actually within Russian culture, so first of all, th there's this space under the floorboards, which, you know, it suggests somewhere that not only humans can't enter, but they can't actually live there. So in Russian culture, that space is where evil spirits and demons reside. So um, that gives, uh, yeah, as Amanda was saying, a different sort of connotation to the book because these ideas aren't just underground because they're edgy and new and whatever, and like they're kind of pushing the status quo. It's that Dostoevsky, I guess, doesn't think they have a place in Russian society, or at least they might have a negative effect on society because they're new and untested and you don't know what the consequences might be. Um, but yeah, so moving on to the two parts of the book, um, I guess, well, what in interests me about Dostoevsky's writing as general is how, in general, is how um, even within this rambling of this unnamed narrator. It goes on and on and it's super complicated. Um, and Dostoevsky is obviously criticizing this, um, well, first of all, utopianism, I guess, and then rational egoism, I think it's called. And, but the thing is, he really creates the most compelling arguments for both sides. So even things he doesn't agree with, he, you you find yourself agreeing with the narrator, the, the anti-hero of the book, even though you know you shouldn't. And that's what's so good about Dostoevsky is it's an, it's not just an open and shut critique of an ideology. You actually go through the motions of trying to figure out a moral problem throughout the book. 
And so I think, um, yeah, you see the, how that plays out in the second part where he, he becomes obsessed at one point with this soldier who shoved him aside at a pub one night and he follows him around for years, like trying to figure out how am I going to take my revenge on this guy? Uh, and the, the guy doesn't even know who he is, this soldier. So one day he like bumps into him and now he's like, I've had my revenge now. I can, I, I can let it go after two years of being obsessed with this one soldier. And so I think it's, uh, it's just such an interesting fictional character to go into because, I mean, as Dostoevsky says at the start of the book as well, there's a little note that says, uh, the narrator and these notes are obviously fictional, but I'm confident that people like this exists. And as you read, you sort of become more aware that, yeah, actually this book may have been written in Russia in the 1860s. But actually, I can see bits of myself in this crazy guy and I don't want to agree with him, but I do agree with him yeah, sometimes. Yeah, I really yeah. struggled with that. I, I really dislike the central character, which is a very Dostoevsky thing. Um, and But then I had to realise that the, the reason I disliked him was that sometimes I agreed with him and that was like a part of myself that I didn't want to reflect on. Yeah. <laughs> um, and also I think, uh, yeah, that Dostoevsky was saying that this character exists. I think when I was reading it, I was thinking that, there was like a couple of people in high school who I think this was mm -hmm. going on like even more so in their head. Um, but when I was reading it as well, looking at the concept of um, living under the floorboards, um, I couldn't help but think of bringing it into a modern context. The relationship to that or the similarity to that um, to what's kind of happening with online culture right now um, and I think you're – um, description makes it even more perfect of this, these people who feel like they don't have a place in society and that they're going to these kind of uh, online spaces and there's a kind of nihilistic culture building there. Amanda, what do you think about that kind of connection? I think that's a, um, a really wise kind of observation to draw from the book because, um, you know, nihilism is such an important theme of the book and it's part of why a central character who is who is petty and who takes his little bit of power and lords it over everybody else and who, um, you know, he's, he's really unattractive, but his nihilism is pretty timeless in a way and there is a deep streak of nihilism in the way that we see people engage in the online world, I think, in the, in the idea that, you know, no, nothing really matters and um, that you can choose to detach from real society and exist in this other place where you aren't who you really are. Um, you don't behave like you would if you were among real people. Um, but nevertheless, all of those decisions have consequences. Um, I, think, I think it's a really wise kind of parallel and um, in many ways it can help us to understand what motivates the actions of the modern troll. Theodore, kind of linking to that, I think that that online culture may actually be a reaction to um, something that's going on in the world right now. And there is a, a, a part of the book in the beginning where he talks about that men are not piano keys and about not wanting to be kind of um, understood in a way that you're just something that can be kind of predicted I feel like maybe with identity politics becoming a bigger and bigger thing, there's this more of a push in culture to know you are a piano key, you are this and this is what you should be and that even this online um, culture developing, which is quite nihilistic, is maybe a reaction to that just like our now area is kind of reacting to Russian society at the time. What do you think mm, of that? Yeah, I would agree with that. And I think uh, the troll comparison is really interesting because, I mean, actually, I think you could say the narrator sort of relates to the modern day troll in a couple of ways. So first of all, that idea of the piano key, oh, I don't want to be like everyone else. I don't want to be predictable and so on. Um, and he talks about that all the time. I'm so different to other people. Oh, if only they knew what was going on in my mind right now. I, I'm smarter than the rest of these people. Why am I surrounded by idiots? Um, but he also reverts back to sort of um, 
typical romantic tropes and he imagines himself being, oh, you know, I'm going to challenge a guy to a duel, which was very old fashioned, by the way. This guy is like harking back to the previous century. Oh, I'm going to be someone who slaps this guy across the face and I'll, I'll challenge him to a duel on the dawn, to uh, like a dawn to restore my honor. Uh, and I'm going to, you know, romance a girl in a very old fashioned way and I'll be this amazing romantic hero. And then he turns on himself and he's like, no, but I don't want to be a romantic hero because that's what everyone thinks is the ideal. So there's kind of that flipping back and forth between do I want to fit in? Do I want to like deliberately be uh, uh, contradicting the rest of society? And then there's also that just that element of meanness of the internet troll of trying to latch, trying to identify people's weaknesses and their foibles and latching onto that and trying to exploit it for the sense of power. So as Amanda mentioned earlier, this guy's so bitter. He's a civil servant. So he works in like petty bureaucracy anyway. I mean, a very bureaucratic country and whatever little bit of power he can exert over other people, he loves to do that. Like when he's trying to figure out what's Lisa's weakness uh, how can I like make her cry? He basically makes her have like a nervous breakdown and reassess her entire life mm. because he keeps egging her on and saying, oh, don't you wish you were like married and had children? Oh, maybe I would marry you, you know? Oh, what what happened to you to push you out onto the streets? And he just keeps egging away at her until he finds that weakness and pushes her to breaking point. And so that's, yeah, that's basically what an internet troll does, I guess, in many ways. So I guess you can, you know, looking at that, you can say, people haven't really changed that much. I think a lot of people in our times do still have that tendency to want to try to exert some element of control over people wherever they can. And they're always looking for those weaknesses. So I think that's really interesting. People don't change over 160 years, apparently. I don't know about you guys, but I found that men are not piano tease passage. Um, one of the most memorable bits of mm. the book and it almost brings together um, all of the hard concepts in just a couple of passages um, as well as a couple of passages can anyway. You know, it, it encapsulates this idea of the existentialist being consumed with individuality, you know, the, the thinking, feeling, acting, aching individual and um the idea that they are confronted with this hostile or indifferent world and it then goes on to sort of engage that intelligent but sort of obsessed with what is going on in his own head um, man with the fact that he is in a world where um, there is this utopian push this um, this belief that you can program out human existence according to particular economic laws. You know, that's essentially what mm. was driving the people who were behind the Russian Revolution, the idea that, you know, we can in our perfect utopia provide enough for everyone to eat and enough funds for everybody to live comfortably and, and everyone will do their share of the work and everyone will be honest and good. Um, and it, it engages with that concept and and shows it to be contrary to human nature the whole man is not piano keys um idea is that human nature is different to the laws of nature you can't um treat as as predictable and um able to be sort of formulated according to the recipe each individual human life because Everyone is different. And even if you tried to put them in the box in the way that, say, modern identity politics does or try to provide for them um, everything in the economic sense like the, the utopians of, of that era did, it's a project that's doomed to failure because in, in Dostoevsky's, I think, formulation, he's saying that even if you think you got the laws right, human nature is going to try and defy that anyway just to prove that he's a man and not a piano key um that he is that he's a man and not an animal that he's more than just um a living creature to be fed and watered and who will sit there contentedly as a consequence um that what makes us human that what makes us man 
Um, it's my irony that we're talking a lot about man in a conversation between ladies, but you get the idea. Um, that what makes us human is the fact that we strive, the fact that we grow, that we um, are in many ways satisfied more by the process of getting through hardship and learning from it than we might be from just sort of sitting back and having someone provide our equal share all the time. Um, And that stuff I think is really compelling um, as a critique of the utopian vision for the world, but it's also I think really useful now as we think about, Renee, some of the things you mentioned before around identity politics and um the the ways that tries to sort us all into boxes yeah no I think that's really true it's kind of touchy on that thing of you know um that we all think or there is a kind of really simplistic think that uh way of thinking that happiness is the end goal for a life and it, like Dostoevsky is kind of questioning that it's like do you really want just Ooh. simple happiness or do mm. you want do you want a little bit of suffering do you want a bit of challenge do you want a little bit of grit in your life and I think that's what mm. he's kind of touching on here um but going back to the narrator um this is kind of one of the first examples of the anti-hero um which is a t- term that Dostoevsky coined um and uh, Amanda, what do you think about kind of the comparison the narrator keeps making between who he actually is and this kind of ideal hero and kind of the concept of the anti-hero that Dostoevsky plays with? I think both in this book and in Crime and Punishment, um, Dostoevsky does a really good job of building up this character who we dislike and he, and he really strongly draws that reaction from the reader. I know I, I sort of found a real distaste for his self-obsession and his pettiness and his um, lack of kindness and compassion for others. And um, he then, once he's built him up into this really strong, repugnant character, starts to draw the connections between who we all are and and this character. And um, in many ways, it shows, I think, a real intellectual strength on his part because he doesn't set up a weak character to destroy him um, or a weak character to prove his point. He sets up a really strong character um, and then uses the ideas to dismantle all of the things that he is driven by um, and I think that's really fascinating. I don't, I can't think of another writer who can do an anti-hero like this. Um, Theodora, you're probably more well-read than me, but um, <laughs> well, I can't think of anyone who does that so well and it's compelling. It's, um, you know, at times like watching a car crash, um, you know, repugnant but also you don't want to take your eyes away. And um, then you, you suddenly sort of turned as you go, oh, hang on, you know, there's, there's bits of that in all of us. And um, I think that's part of the magic of the anti-hero. Dostoevsky, more than any writer, does not straw man anything. Yes, he does, yes. <laughs> it, there is that's the no, right way to express it, yes. <laughs> there are no straw mans in Dostoevsky's writing. Every concept is in its strongest form represented and he really, like, builds these things and then watches them clash with each other. It's so crazy how much we can justify the the thinking and the actions of the characters that we actually hate. And it's so great. So we, like we, we considered Dostoevsky, Dostoevsky is normally considered to be, I guess, a conservative writer, a Christian writer. He definitely mm. has uh, a lot of traditional worldviews and he was very concerned uh at the sort of moral crisis that Russia was experiencing at the end of the 19th century, where, you know, Western Europe had had a couple of centuries to figure out what um, utilitarianism was and what all these different, like, you know, what's nihilism? How do we start dealing with nihilism? Russia had to adapt a lot quicker. Um, But so despite him, you know, having his own views, as you said, he's not, 
she's not like ideology, uh, ideological in the sense we would normally think of an ideological writer. He's not preachy in any way. And he, I, I don't think he pretends to have all the answers. I, th- I think he knows he doesn't have all the answers to all the big questions. So his novels are actually like a big thought experiment. Going back to what uh, Theodora was touching on and these kind of battle that is still going on today about whether we can really construct society and even the battle um, between kind of traditional and progress, uh, progressive um, values that continues now. I, I imagine that you come across it um, a lot working as a senator and what are your kind of thoughts on what we can learn from this that we can maybe apply right now? I think what we can take away from it, you could, you could get like a long list of lessons, but I think one really useful lesson we can take away from it is the idea um, that the human experience isn't something that can be given a formula for happiness, that everyone's definition of the perfect life is going to be different and that there is no way that you can take this theory of the utopian world and um, apply it like arithmetic to um, the way we live our lives because every single one of us is different. And by our very nature, um, we, we want to express that individuality and we want to um, have a richness of human experience that demands we all be a bit different. And so all the well-meaning giant government programs of the world that promise to make us all um, equal in the, um, in the material sense, in the power sense, in the every other sense, um, they can never really be much more than false promises in circumstances where um, the, the human, what, what it means to be human, um, defies the ability to um, follow a kind of mathematical prescription for Um, a life of perfection. It just, um, it can't be done and it doesn't exist. And the way that Dostoevsky um, takes this really strong character and um, then so cleverly turns us um, into this state of repugnance for a lot of the things that he stands for, I think illustrates that better than um, sort of any nonfiction work of ideology ever could. As we kind of come to the end of our discussion, I thought that the next thing we should do is um, recommend to the audience um, if they enjoyed this book, um, some other works, writings, even film or theatre that they think that you think is inspired by or kind of connected to the work of Dostoevsky that, um, or even by Dostoevsky still himself, uh, that you would recommend uh, to the audience. Amanda, we'll start with you. I'm going to keep it fairly simple and go with Crime and Punishment. If somebody hasn't read Crime and Punishment, um, I think it is a brilliant work, possibly even more brilliant than this one. Um, And in many ways, I think it's an easier introduction to Dostoevsky than this one. Um, Not that I want to discourage this book. It's also fabulous. Um, (laughs) Read them both. Um, But I would suggest that as one absolutely worth reading. If you want to read Connected books, I'd probably suggest, um, although strictly speaking, he's not an existentialist, he's still in a related camp and the work of um, Camus maybe Mm -hmm. um, is is worth reading for um, comparison and um, for another perspective on the way that we can tackle the questions of um, how you reconcile the rationality or irrationality of the world with the um, individualistic nature of man. So that would probably be my tip for a related related option. Um, I don't think I've got a movie that pops to mind, um, but if people are interested in um, this idea of the way that we are raising children and teaching children in our schools and later in our universities um, to expect the world to adapt to them rather than cope with notions of boundaries and imperfection and the the need to strive for self-improvement rather than being born perfect 
um, then I can't recommend enough the coddling of the American mind, mm. um, which I think does a really good job of bringing together um, concepts from psychology and parenting and education theory and even pop culture into one place to help us understand this phenomenon of um, people who feel like they need to have the whole world turned into a safe space in which they are never confronted with anything that um, challenges their worldview. Um, there are a couple of further recommendations that I think are worth checking out. Thank you for those. I think they are wonderful recommendations. But Theodora, what would you recommend that our audience read if they enjoyed um, Notes from Underground? Uh, so I definitely am going to back up Amanda's recommendations there. I'll also say if you're interested in reading more Dostoevsky, um, Devils or Demons, depending on the translation, is a fantastic book where Dostoevsky takes his experiences in being in those like sort of socialist literati circles uh, and he shows exactly the consequences of what happens uh, when nihilism and socialism just meets with traditional Russian life head on. Uh, I think it's a really important one for students to read if they're concerned about still the popularity of socialism in our times. Um, the Brothers Karamazov is an amazing one for showing how, uh, you know, the most repulsive characters are always the smartest or the most powerful. Um, Dostoevsky will build up uh, the most convincing argument for atheism you've ever read before destroying it. Um, it's pretty amazing. Um, I've also heard that the movies American Psycho and Taxi Driver are kind of influenced by Notes from Underground, but I haven't actually seen those. So mm. I've seen Taxi Driver. Know. I can see, I can see that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, actually, mm. that was going to be um, my recommendation. Okay. To touch on that because <laughs> I, I do. I highly recommend Taxi Driver um, as a, a kind of. Yeah, I, I found a lot of parallels between that. The more mm. modern example would be The Joker, but I mm. didn't think that was quite as good a film. Um, but I know that a lot of people have watched that. So if you did enjoy The Joker, I would say definitely read um, Notes from Underground. Yeah. I think that comes deep brings us to the end of our discussion, ladies. I would love to thank you both. I think I would um, say that Jordan Peterson would be very proud of our discussion today. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so thank you, Theodora, for your time. And thank, thank you, you so much, um, Senator Amanda Stoker, for taking time out of your schedule to discuss literature with us. It was an absolute pleasure. It's a joy to be with two of the smartest ladies in town. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. And... Thank you for listening. And also, Theodora, can you tell our audience just a little bit about how they can get involved in Better Read the Dead, the book club? Yeah, so if you enjoyed our discussion today and you want to read some more of these fabulous books, head to generationliberty.org.au uh, where you can find out all the information about Better Read Than Dead. If you're a Generation Liberty member, sign up for free. If you're not a member, it's only $10 free books hello what are you waiting for <laughs> um, so yeah generationliberty.org.au but for now thank you so much for listening i hope you enjoyed this discussion and go and discuss this book with your friends and have more discussions about literature and philosophy and i hope that you tune in next time to join us for another discussion about another classic book 